One of the most astonishing success stories I've ever come across, I've been in the investment business for a long time, as Adrian says, and I've run into a lot of amazing success stories, but somebody, somebody has really pulled off a miracle here. So I guess it's all of you who've done this, and uh, my congratulations to you. What we're going to talk about today is what I see going on in the world and what I'm doing about it with my own money, my own life, my own everything. Since I don't have a job, I have to invest my, my life as well as my money too. So you're going to see some of the things I'm doing to make sure that my, my family and I get along well. We will start, as some of you know, a few years ago, my then fiance and now wife spent three years driving around the world. We drove 245,000 kilometers, three years on the road, 146, uh, 116 countries. We started in Iceland. We drove through Europe, Turkey, China, Korea, Japan, back into Siberia, Mongolia, across Russia, all around Europe, 32 countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South America, up to Central America, up to Alaska, back down to the southern part of the United States, and back to New York. That was three years on the road, it was 116 countries, 245,000 kilometers, so we were a little tired when we got home. We decided we would stop and rest for a while. Well, one result of resting for a while is I now have a baby daughter. And I want you to know, all of my life, I was very, very, very much against children. I thought children were a hopeless, useless, terrible waste of time, money, energy, and everything else. I felt so sorry for all of you fools who had children. I couldn't believe you would mess up your life that way. Well, I want you to know I was totally wrong. I was 100% wrong about children. This little girl is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I cannot get enough of her 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If there's anybody in the room who hasn't done it, let me urge you to get home and get on with it. <laughs> you know, I am telling you, take a day off. No, 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 don't, don't, don't take a day off these days. But go home for lunch. I mean, have a lunch hour. And you will see, it is a lot of fun. It's wonderful. Now, when I speak, uh, well, when I speak in Asia, too, and in the West, I explain to everybody that first you should have children. And by the way, in, the, in Asia, where I live now, they think boys are better than girls. That is completely wrong, completely wrong. Girls are much, much better than boys. So if you go home for lunch, be sure you have a girl and not a boy. And there's a shortage of girls developing anyway in the world. But I tell everybody that you should teach your children and grandchildren Mandarin because Asia is going to be the most important part of the world in their lifetime in the 21st century. I was told that some of you here, many of you are Asians in fact, so I'll show you a short video just to show you that I mean it. And this will show you, I know most of you probably don't speak Mandarin, I don't. Wait, wait. Tell them who you are. Tell them your name. 大家好,我是快乐罗杰斯,今年在南洋小学读六年级,我五月就十二岁了,我很喜欢新加坡,很喜欢南洋小学。You can see that I'm taking my own advice, at least those of you who speak Mandarin are from Asia, and again I'm told that at least 20% of us are from, from Asia today, but China is going to be the next great country in the world. You know, the 19th century was the century of the UK, the 20th century was the century of the U.S. The 21st century is going to be the century of China, whether we like it or not. There are many people in the West who do not like that. There are many others who say, oh, don't worry, it's going to collapse any day, fall apart, never to be revived. It probably will have some setbacks. I know it will have setbacks. 
In the United States, we became the most successful country in the 20th century, but along the way, we had a horrible civil war. We had 15 depressions with a D. We had very little rule of law. We had massacres in the streets, and yet we became the most successful country in the 20th century. China's gonna have plenty of problems. For instance, right now, they have a lot of debt, huge amounts of debt built up. They haven't had a recession in 25 years, which is very, very strange, as all of you know. Most countries have recessions every four to seven years. So China's gonna have problems, but it's going to come out of those problems, just as America did, and will become the most successful country in the 21st century. So when I say I'm teaching my children Chinese, you can see that I mean it. And when I say go home for lunch, you go home for lunch because here, I went home for lunch one day and there she is. And as you can see, we have another little girl and she too speaks Mandarin as well, which you will see. <laughs> Tell them who you are. You want to do one more? You have anything else you want to do? I don't speak Mandarin, so I have no idea what she said. The people, those of you who do speak Mandarin can probably say, wow, at least most people do. But I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to show you a two-minute video of what it's like to go around the world. And the reason I'm going to do that, some of you know, I spent two years driving around the world on a motorcycle and another three years going around the world in a car. Well, I cannot show you five years of driving around the world in two minutes, but a survey recently showed that the number one dream which people have, not, not everybody's number one dream, but the dream which comes out on top is to chuck it all, get in the car or the motorcycle, and drive around the world. So I hope that all of you are going to make so much money with a Moondi that you too are going to get a new spouse or take the old spouse, take, take a spouse, and head off around the world. It will start with us in Iceland, toasting each other, wondering if we will make it alive, off to the Great Wall. We did get married on the trip. Here we are cutting our cake. This is our honeymoon. We ran into many camels out there on the road. We went through 15 war zones. These guys were not very friendly at first, but if you look in the upper right hand corner, you will see a familiar face. One of many markets we visited. This is one of many bad roads. A bad time, we went to an AIDS orphanage in South Africa. We went to see King Tut. Whenever we could, we stopped at schools because I'm very keen on education. Everybody always wanted to have their pictures made. Myanmar, which used to be called Burma. Iguazu Falls in South America. This is the bane of my existence. This is bureaucracy, red tape, regulations. This, on the other hand, is the black market. This is a much higher class of people. And when we got back to the US, we kept going. We headed up to Alaska in the dead of winter. And when we got back to the U.S., 
Our first stop was the World Trade Center, which had blown up while we were gone. So let's go around the world again. Only this time, let's talk about some of the things that are happening, and then we're going to have questions from you about anything you want. I've explained to you that the most important thing happening in the 21st century is the rise of China. It's going to change. It is changing everything we know. There are many people who will tell you it's going to fall apart any day. Uh, I submit to you that it's not. My, we moved to Asia so that my children would speak Mandarin and so that they would know Asia for the 21st century. They will have setbacks along the way. In America, we had many setbacks. Britain had setbacks when they rose. France at one time, Spain at one time. So there are going to be many problems. But in China, they save and invest over 35% of their income. In America, we save and invest 2 or 3% of our income. America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. You know how many assets China has. One difference in China now and a decade ago or two decades ago is they do have debt, and that debt will continue to rise because they're not doing enough about it. And the next time the world has a recession, which will happen in the next year or two, China's not going to be able to bail us out the way they have in the past. My own investments, I'm short the United States, and I'm long China, among other things. But the one reason I'm long China is because a couple of years ago, uh, I'm going to show you a slide. A couple of years ago, they had a, an economic plenum in Beijing, which they said is the most important economic, one of the three most economic events of the past 35 years. One of the things they said, and I wish that we would do this in America and Europe, is that the government is going to make, let the markets make decisions in the future. But from an investment point of view, I mean, this is obviously very good for China and for the world. I wish we would do it in the West. But they also listed companies and sectors that they're going to put a lot of emphasis on in the next couple of decades. This list you can get. Anybody can get it. This is where I'm long. There are going to be some bankruptcies in China, especially in, in property in the next few years. But things you all know that pollution is horrible in China. I don't live in China because it's so filthy. But you can see other things. Health care. They desperately need health care. Railroads. You know about the One Belt, One Road project. So many things that China is, is emphasizing. This is where I'm long going forward. And as I said, I'm short, mainly short in the United States going forward. There is going to be a big economic problem. There's going to be turmoil and chaos in the next couple of years. So I hope that my longs in China offset my shorts in the U.S. and other places. Uh, just to show you uh, the, how the market has done in China, you can see there was a big boom back in 2007 and 8 when the rest of the world did. Then it did nothing. Had another rally last year, which has come down as the rest of the world has. One reason I'm short the U.S. and long China is because the United States stock market, as you all know, is near its all-time highs. Well, as you can see, China is down 60% from its all-time high. I prefer to buy low and sell high, and I'm sure all of you were, t were taught the same lesson. Now, while we're talking about longs and shorts, uh, we need to talk about the U.S. dollar. I mainly long the U.S. dollar. I have lots of U.S. dollars. And the reason I have the U.S. dollar, and by the way, the U.S. dollar is a terribly flawed currency. The United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and the debts are going higher. So you will say, why, why do you own the U.S. dollar? I own it because when the turmoil comes in the next two or three years, people are going to flock to a safe haven. They think the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It is not a safe haven. But if you look around, and partly because of tradition, people will go to the U.S. dollar. They're not going to buy the euro. They're not going to buy the Russian ruble. They're not going to buy the Swiss franc, partly because there are not enough of them, but partly because the Swiss have really been bungling it recently. So out of habit, if nothing else, people will buy the dollar. The dollar will go higher. It will become overpriced. It might even turn into a bubble depending on how bad the, the turmoil is, at which point I hope I'm smart enough to sell my U.S. dollars 
and put them elsewhere. I have thoughts about elsewhere where it might be, but let's get from here to there first. I need to show you one other slide, and this is why we're going to have, one reason we're going to have turmoil. As you can see, and as you all know, interest rates have never been this low in the history of the world. Never in recorded history have we had a period like this where central banks all over the world are printing staggering amounts of money. The Japanese said we will print unlimited, that's their word, amounts of money. But the Europeans said, well, we will do whatever it takes. That's their term. The Americans, as you know, started it all, have printed huge amounts of money. So we now have interest rates at an unbelievably low interest rate, never before in history. It will not last. You know, all of you were taught to save your money and invest for the future, and a lot of people have done that. But they're all being wiped out now. You have pension plans all over the world being wiped out, insurance companies, endowment because they can earn nothing on their savings. So when this changes, and it will change, and interests go back, I, I won't tell you how high they're gonna go because you would stop listening to me, but when interest rates start going higher again, whew, boy, a lot of us are not going to survive. I hope that I survive, but it's gonna be real turmoil and chaos when interest rates go back to normal rates. I am not short bonds, but I am short junk bonds. I'm sure at junk bonds in the United States because the spreads are so narrow and when interest rates go back up, I hope that I get a double whammy. One other hated market that I have to show you is agriculture. You can see that top line that, that I started an agricultural index and some other commodities index, but you can see that agricultural is down 31% in the last 17 years. That's a bear market. That has not been a good place to be. And if you buy low and if you sell high, I will tell you that agriculture, I am investing in agriculture. I'm long agriculture. Agriculture has been so horrible that the average age of farmers in America is 58. In Japan, it's 66. In Canada, it's the oldest in recorded history. Australia, it's 58. More people in the UK commit suicide in agriculture than any other economic sector. Millions of Indian farmers commit suicide. Agriculture has been a terrible, terrible place to be uh, in America. More students study public relations than study agriculture. What more do you need to know? This is a terrible, terrible place to have invested for a long time. I suggest to you, here you can see that green line is the agricultural index. You can see what a nightmare it has been. This is going back for 18 years. And this show, this is done of, of many indexes around the world. And you can see down there at the bottom is agriculture. So agriculture has been a horrible place to invest. I'm investing in agriculture because something has to change or we're not going to have any clothes or any food at any price. The world is already starting to notice that this, this has been a disaster and you're going to see changes. One other hated market, and as you may have noticed by now, I like to buy things that are hated and depressed. Perhaps the most hated market in the world right now is Russia. Uh, this shows you what's happened to the Russian stock market over the past few years. I doubt if there's anybody in the room besides me who owns Russian shares but Russia has vast natural resources. It has a convertible currency, which most markets like this don't. It's not a big debtor nation, like many of these countries are debtor nations. For 47 years, I was bearish on Russia. I first went to Russia in 1966, and I came away saying this will never work. For 47 years, I was a bear on Russia, but in the last three years, I have seen things changing in, this, in the Kremlin, so I have started investing in Russia, not just because of the vast resources, they've always had vast resources, but because I see basic major changes taking place in the Kremlin. One company in which I've invested, and I'm not suggesting you invest in this, I'm showing it to make a point, I'm a director of a Russian agriculture country company. It combines Russia, which is hated, and agriculture, which has been horrible, 
This is a very large fertilizer company. I'm a director, so, so I'm, I'm not giving you inside information. I'm not suggesting you buy it, but I'm trying to make the point, the investment point, that if you get the right hated areas and you get them at the right time, you can make a lot of money. Russia's hated, agriculture's hated, China's feared. I'm sure that everybody in this room has had somebody come to you in the last couple of years and tell you China's going to collapse. A friend of mine, a guy I know and respect a lot, has been telling me for seven years, since 2009, that China's the next Dubai. It's going to collapse any day. He told me it's going to be a thousand times worse than Dubai. He's been telling me this for seven years. So you'll hear many skeptics about many things. I like when markets are not liked and depressed and despised. That's a way that if I've had any success, it has been basically buying things that are very cheap, where there's positive change taking place. And if I get it right, sometimes I make money. That's on the long side. On the short side, I like to sell things short that everybody loves if I can find a reason that something is going wrong. So I think what I should do on that happy note, I'm going to stop because I know there are questions, and I'd rather talk to you about the questions that you have rather than things that I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do is stop. If we can find Adrian, we're going to take questions. Merci. Uh, gracias. Penhouse. Thank you. Ah, there you hey. are. There Thank you, you Jim. Have a seat. Let's have a conversation together and with our audience. There you go. So I know there have been some uh, questions fired at us. Uh, so uh, le let me ask you uh, my own first question uh, as, as I uh, take a, a look at some of these that are coming in as we speak. My first question to you is uh, regarding emerging markets. Do you really think that emerging markets benchmarks are even relevant today, or is each one of these countries uh, such a unique case that trying to talk about emerging market investing through benchmark approaches is, is non-relevant? Uh, Time magazine once called me the Indiana Jones of investing because I've been investing in these markets for decades. I never thought of them as a, as a class. Uh, I just would find cheap markets. So the answer to your question is they are not a class. Each one can be its own disaster or can be its own great triumph. So if you're investing in emerging markets, stop thinking that way and find the right ones. I'm looking for, in fact, just yesterday, it's interesting because this is a big exhibit here for Kazakhstan. Just yesterday, I opened my account in Kazakhstan because I hope to be investing in Kazakhstan soon. Nigeria, beginning to make major changes. Venezuela is going to collapse soon, but that will be an opportunity. So you have to judge them individually. You cannot judge them as a class, or you will not make any money. All right. Uh, let's um, let's uh, take a question here. So uh, would you advise a young financial investor today to start his career in commodities trading? Uh, unless you love finance, I wouldn't advise him to go into finance at all. You know, we've had all of us. I mean, we've had long periods where the people who produce real goods were in charge and the masters of the universe, followed by long periods when financial types were the masters of the universe. Well, we've had our 30 years. I mean, I hate to tell you, we've had our 30 years, and we're now going to be a, not a very good place to be, not a good sector. Uh, right now, you all know governments all over the world don't like us. They're taxing us. They're putting regulations on us. You know that there's huge debt in the financial community. There was no debt in the financial community when I started. When I, I used to be a student at, at Oxford in England, and my professors used to say, what is wrong with you? Why are you interested in the stock market? It is a backwater. It is not relevant. Nobody cares. But now you go to Oxford, and every kid there is starting a hedge fund in her room. Everybody's going into finance. In 1958, America produced 5,000 MBAs. The rest of the world produced none. Last year, America produced 200,000 MBAs, and the rest of the world produced tens of thousands. What more do you need to know? I mean, finance is not a good place to be. I mean, listen, I love it. 
And when I, in the 60s, I loved it. That's how I went into finance, despite my professors. I didn't know enough to know that it was a terrible place to be. But if you love it, sure, go into finance. But otherwise, I wouldn't go into finance in 2017, 2018. We have the wind at our face now. I'm obviously not going to leave. I still adore and love this life of investing, and that's all I want to do. But if you want to make a living and get rich, learn to drive a tractor. Uh, having said that, uh, and speaking of tractors, uh, it's, uh, it's relevant. In that question, there was an aspect about commodities. Should somebody go into commodities I today? Said, learn and, to drive a tractor. Okay. If you want to go into finance, you should go into uh, commodities more than any other, or Chinese finance. The Chinese have not had a financial uh, industry for a long time, for reasons we all know. But before the Second World War, Shanghai was the largest financial center in the world between New York and London. It will be again. That chart I showed, the Chinese government is doing everything it can to develop a financial industry. So if you don't like being in finance in the West, either learn to drive a tractor or move to China. Okay, the audience is really active with questions, so let's, let's fire as many as we can before we run out of time. And next question is, your thoughts on sustainable investing and decarbonization? Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not investing in either. Uh, if you can find sustainable wind power or some of the other alternative energies, yes, you're gonna make a huge fortune, or solar power, you're gonna make a staggering fortune. The problem is that most, is, most of those sources of energy are not competitive, uh, competitive with real, with natural energy. Uh, now, everybody, if you can get subsidies, of course, you'll make a lot of money, but it's not my style to invest in subsidized industries. I prefer something that's real and competitive. Let's come to China, which is uh, something that you feel passionately about. Can China be successful without political and social reform? No. <laughs> I mean... The first time I went to China in 1984, I, first of all, I was terrified because I'd been listening to American propaganda all my life about the evil, vicious Chinese. But there was one radio, one TV, one dress, no cars, no buses. There was nothing. It was a disaster. But since then, it has changed enormously. There are now over 50,000 demonstrations in China every year, many media outlets. The country's already changed dramatically. They change the government every five to 10 years. This would not, the China that exists today did not exist in, as recently as 1984. It continues to change. Now, maybe your question is, will they have revolution and, and disaster? Let's suppose they have revolution. They're not gonna bring Mao Zedong back. They're gonna throw out the communist. I mean, he's happened to be good communist, but no, they'll change, the, it'll be even more capitalist than it was before. All right, as I said, we've got great questions here. Let's just fire them away and keep them short answers. Uh, thoughts on FinTech? FinTech? FinTech, financial no, technology it's, company. it's changing very, very dramatically. Everything I know about finance will probably be obsolete in five or 10 years. My children will never go to a bank, for instance. My children will never go to a post office. No, it's, it's, it's a good thing I'm a, as old as I am, because uh, I would not be able to, to keep up. Somebody wants to know how you judge that an asset is liked by everybody. In other words, what are the criteria that you look at? You get a chart, and if it's up here, everybody likes it. If it's down here, nobody likes it. Okay, that's the best answer <laughs> I've ever It's called buy so low and sell high. Um, and I hope all of your mothers and fathers taught you to buy low and sell high. Um, Just if, you have a, if you're in doubt, you send me an email, and I will tell you if it's loved or hated. Um, now, uh, again, China decided to alter its foreign exchange policy this year. Uh, do you think a hard landing is unavoidable? China's going to have bankruptcies. China has not had bankruptcies for decades, but the government has said we're going to let people go bankrupt. Now, I hope they mean it. It will be good for China. It will be good for the world. They have, as I said before, it's been over 25 years since China had an economic setback a significant economic setback. That is enormously unusual. You know that as well as I do. So the next time around, they're gonna have bankruptcies, setbacks, problems, very unhappy people, uh, turmoil, and that I hope will be an opportunity. Uh, we had it in America, we had 
15 depressions, as I told you. The Chinese have a wonderful word. We don't have it in English. I don't know if you have it in French. It's Wei Ji Yu Gan. What it means is opportunity and disaster are the same thing. Whenever there's a disaster, there's opportunity. It's a wonderful word. It's going to happen in China. I hope that the stocks I own are the right ones to come through the disaster. And if so, maybe I'll survive. And uh, finally, some joker in the audience uh, is asking a funny question, so we might as well end on a, a note of humor, saying, now that you've discovered, although belatedly, how to have children, how many more do you intend to have? <laughs> well, I think about that often, but my wife is now 47 years old, and we have two really, really, really good children. And I know a lot of people who kept trying, and they had some duds. I got some cousins who are real duds. Uh, so I'm going to stop now. Let's have a warm and uh, big round of applause for Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.